Hi, I'm Mark Guerrero. This is uh, East LA Music Stories, Volume 5. And my guest today is singer-songwriter George Ochoa. George started out with the Slauson Brothers in East LA and uh, later played with uh, my band, The Men From Sound. Uh, he played with Cannibal and the Headhunters with Frankie Cannibal Garcia. They went to New York. We're going to talk about that, 1968. Um, and then he was in an old time religion, recorded a couple of singles for Warner Brothers. He was with Yaki, recorded an album with Playboy Records. Uh, he played with Redbone and Pat Vegas in the early 2000s and many more things we're gonna talk about. How's it going, George? Good, man, how are you? Very good. Uh, so, so tell me, uh, what got you interested in music and what made you think you could sing and it, was there music in your family tree? No, uh, my brother, came up with the idea to, um, cause he liked the Solace brothers and uh, the other brothers that were around during East LA times. Your brother, and, John. Yeah, my brother, John, yes. And he just uh, said, sing this and I just sang it. <laughs> That's all. And so he really? just do this and I just did it, you know. And he just- He was older than you, right? Yes, he was. So uh, how did the Slauson brothers get started? And why did you think of the name Slauson Brothers? How? I don't know. My brother came up with it because uh, um, he didn't want Ochoa Brothers or, you know, like the Solace Brothers. He didn't want that. So he came up with a name from the Slauson Brothers. And I don't know why. I guess because of the dance Slauson that was happening. It was at, very it was very popular at the time in East Yeah, that, that, that was why. And that was why he did it. And uh, you were often backed up by the Impalas band, weren't you? Yes. Yes, the Impalas uh, and uh, you guys recorded a song called Rosalie. Uh, where'd you get the song? And uh, tell me about that. Uh, Willie Alvarez had written it uh, with uh, the Apollos. Was he the drummer? Yeah, he was a drummer, yeah, yeah. Well, he played guitar too, he was a talented man. And uh, he uh, came up with a song, so uh, my brother taught it to us. My brother wrote the last verse, actually. But, you know, nobody was worried about those kind of things at that time. It was a two-part harmony, kind of a doo-wop, uh, ice cream changes type song. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, of the time. Like and it. how did you get to record it? Who set that up and where did you record it? Um, what was his name? I, I'm trying to remember his name. But he was a DJ at the time. And I'm sorry. Oh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Godfrey or Huggy Yeah, Boy Godfrey. Boy. That's who it was. Oh, Godfrey. Oh, well, okay, cool. You got now, Godfrey <laughs> was actually from Scotland. But he talked like he was from, you know, the hood. Oh. And, uh, and, hey, baby. And he was like a Wolfman Jack character. <laughs> I know. Yeah. He, was a, he was a kind of fellow. Mm -hmm. and he, he recorded us. And then. Uh, and, uh, you mentioned Mystic Studios. Yeah, Mystic Studios. Yeah, it was the little studios they had there up above, uh, across the street from the Capitol. From Capitol. In Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Nice little place. And so it first came out as a single, right? Oh, it was Delphi Studio. That's what it was. Oh, it was Delphi. That's what it was called. Yeah, Delphi. Oh, that was uh, Bob Keen. Yeah, yeah, Bob Keen Studio. Yeah, that's right. But it didn't come out of one of his labels, did it? No, no, we just rented a studio. Um, what label did it come out of? KG. Yeah, yeah. KG? Mm-hmm. KG. Oh, Godfrey, wow. Kerr, Godfrey Kerr's initials reversed. So the label was Godfrey's label? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> And then later it appeared on the famous West Coast East Side Review album. Mm -hmm. Rosalie's on there. Mm -hmm. and, and my band song, uh, Get Your Baby, was on there as well as yeah. Lindell's, Premier's, Cannibal Headhunters. A lot of the East LA groups are on that album. Yeah. You remember being on there? Oh, <laughs> you're talking to me, yes. Yeah, it was, it was good to see your face on a, on, a, on a classic album that turned out to be that, you know, to, to imprint uh, permanently the East LA that I was part of the original East LA sound. Absolutely. And the thrill of how about the first time you heard your record, you know, you played, you actually were on a record. It's pretty exciting. I, I liked it. We heard it on, uh, I think, Huggy Boy. Huggy Boy played it. I'm sure Godfrey played the hell out of it. Okay. Oh, heck yeah. yeah. He made money from it somehow. There you go. So do you have any particular, oh, so let's talk about the Impalas. You had uh, Ronnie Reyes on guitar. Uh -huh. I was uh, Joe Alvarez on bass, uh, Willie on drums. Um, 
I think it was Alan and I on saxophone. I don't know if he was with the band then. He, I remember he was a vocalist. Yeah, he was a vocalist after. But anyways, it was just that, a small little group we had. Mm -hmm. No saxophone, just guitar, bass, and drums. And that was it, actually. Ronnie did all, all the work on that. And then uh, you were in a group called The Executives, and you played at the, uh, the Salesian Rock and Roll Show at East LA College. Oh, and you appeared on volume four, uh, the album. And uh, what song did you do? Well, I didn't, I did uh, uh, Misty, but they, I didn't want them to record that because I said, uh, my right gloves for my right or something silly about uh, Misty. And I was embarrassed about it. So I didn't, I made a put what the other singer sang. Oh, but I'm on the front cover because I look wow. In a tuxedo, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so then uh, was the Men From Sound next or was there something else? No, the Men From Sound was next. Okay. That's where you saw me, I think. Playing yeah, so that. I'll set you, I'll set up that story and then you can jump in. So, um, well, you claim that I saw you sing somewhere. I don't remember the venue. You think it's what? I think it was the executives because I was just a free freelance singer. And you mentioned the, maybe the big union? Yeah, it was the big union. Okay. And you were with uh, your drummer, Ernie. Were right. we just in the audience or were we on the building? You were in the, you were in the audience. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't remember how I hooked up with you where we actually got together, but you were about 15. I was probably 15. Yeah. And um, and I remember I kind of auditioned you on the spot. I, and I don't even know if it was formal, but I just remember you singing a cappella. I know you want to leave, <laughs> but I refuse to let you go. And I go, holy shit, this guy, this kid has chops. Yeah, and uh, I was very impressed with that one little performance. And I said, hey, why don't you uh, join the band? I invited you and you did. Yeah, and when you that. first joined, we were called Mark and the Escorts. My first band had evolved into the Men From Sound. Now that you're rolling it back, I like that band. That was a very good band. The Men From Sound? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we were great. Garfield High School. And then one, I got to tell this story, man. Uh -huh. Even though it's, we're talking about George, we did a, 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 a thing at Griffith High School, I think it was. Oh. Girls attacked you, man. The chicks did, all the little girls were. <laughs> Tell that story, what happened? Well, what happened, we, we went, we did a, a, a like, you know, uh, from, I guess the school sent us from, I don't remember how that happened or you booked it. Well, I, I was a 10th grader at Garfield already. We were invited to go back to my junior high and play an assembly for the student body. Oh, that was it. Were, yeah, so we were 10th graders going back to a junior high. So it was a big deal to them. Yeah. And they were they were, went kind of crazy. <laughs> and then, so we were invited by the teachers after the show and they were screaming like the Beatles and all that. And uh, we went to the cafeteria and that's when the women uh, chased me around. <laughs> the building. Well, did they catch you, Mark? They did. Do you remember when they caught me? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I ran, I ran around the, the cafeteria having my hard day's night moment, you know, with 20 little girls, eighth graders, or whatever, chasing me. And it was fun until I came back in and they caught me in the foyer and started pulling my hair and tearing my shirt and scratching me. And I had to be rescued by the teachers. So it wasn't fun at that point. Yeah. See, so you didn't know the old East LA code hide. That's right. Always you guys it. probably just stayed in there eating. I was inside the curtain. I was around the curtain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, yeah. but the highlight of that band was when we played at, at to me the Garfield High School Assembly. Yeah, I was good. Uh, and by then, I think I was, uh, you know, maybe a, a student. I don't know. But I, but anyway, we played for the entire student body, two assemblies, and um, on the bill with us was the Exotics, another really great East LA band that. Most of the guys went to Garfield, if not all of them. Um, Euphoria, whose bass player was Conrad Lozano, later to be Los Lobos bass player. Uh, and uh, there was another band I don't remember. But it was a great show, and we were at our best because we were really hot. We'd been playing every weekend. We were really, really good. And um, we did a great set. And I remember the songs. I tell you, we did 96 Tears. We did You Sang, I Only Have Eyes for You by the Flamingos. Oh, okay. We did the Shabbat Shabbat. And uh, <laughs> I did Tax Man by the Beatles. And we just tore it up, man. And uh, it was a, a great memory. That was, that was nice. That was a nice group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was a very hot group. On, on or, uh, For FISA Organ, we had Tony Rodas. Mm -hmm. On bass, we had Richard Rosas, later, be known, later to be known as Rick Rosas, uh, who wound up playing with Neil Young and Joe Walsh. 
um, Ernie Hernandez on drums, uh, me on guitar and vocals, and you on vocals. So we, we had three strong lead vocalists with me, you, and Ernie. We had great harmonies. We had a good keyboard player and a good rhythm section. So it was definitely, uh, I think it was definitely uh, my best band of the whole 60s, that, that version of the Men From Sound. That was good. That was fun. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the circumstances uh, with which you left the group? I don't remember what happened. You were with the group for maybe about a year, maybe. I think I went. I went. Uh, I went with Cannibal. Oh, that's what happened. Yeah, and yeah. I don't remember the chicken and the egg. But all I know is you wound up uh, going to New York with uh, Cannibal and Eddie Serrano. At that point, that was Cannibal and the Headhunters. Yes, yes, it was. And you were living in New York, mm -hmm. and I remember visiting you because my brother was living there at the time. Yeah, he was, and I, I went to visit my brother, and I went over to professional dancer. That dad's uh, he's he was a professional yeah, was, on yeah, Broadway. He was, he was kind of more into theater and all the that theater. Stuff. That's yeah, yeah. 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 And, and um, I went to meet you at the apartment where you guys were uh, were living, and I was about eighteen by then. We were about eighteen. Yeah. And uh, before I even got to the house, you were coming out, so I met you on the street. In fact, I saw Eddie Serrano first come out to hello to him and you came out and we got on the subway and started uh, exploring new york city it was just kind of fun two 18 year olds on the subway in new york city yeah. in 1968 so kind of a trip. Try to keep your hand on your wallet you know there you go uh, but i remember i didn't meet cannibal and i didn't see him on that trip no he was, so tell me about that experience with cannibal in new york what did you do I was, um well uh it all started with uh East LA sound, everybody knew who everybody was. And Little Ray had gotten notice uh, from the famous, uh, not, I mean, um, from Seymour Stein, which is the head of si Sire Records. And he came to East LA and he liked them. He wanted to do like a, a kind of like a Paul Anker thing or something like that with him or something like, you know, because uh, he was young and he could, you know, was writing songs already. And he had his, all his groups with him. And he convinced um, Seymour, while he was there, Seymour Stein came to buy the contract from Eddie Davis for uh, Cannibal and the Headhunters. And did he? Yes, and he purchased it. Now, by the way, Seymour Stein later went on to uh, be the manager of Aerosmith and some other- Every, Everything. I mean, he was the, he's the guy. greatest of all time. And to know him personally like that was- it was quite an honor at that time when he was rising, right before he got the deal to pull on Sire Records. We should have stayed with him, but, you know, uh, uh, Ray wanted to, to go home. Anyways, Ray had convinced, uh, uh, convinced uh, Cannibal uh, to go back because uh, what's the name? wanted to buy a contract out and he wanted the group. So Ray convinced him and said, well, just put another group and go. And I said, okay, so who's he, who is it? Well, he knew Eddie already. And then he knew me, I guess, from the pool. You know, it was a pool of singers in East LA. And I pulled up the straw, so uh, my mom let me go. So, so let me get this straight. So are you saying that Ray went to New York before Cannibal did? Oh, we all went together. We all went together. All went together. But, and I understand that Ray was even part of the Cannibal and Henners on some shows. Oh, yeah, he was. That was did fun. he sing with you guys too? Yeah, yeah. Same. So sometimes it was four of you, sometimes it was three of you. Yes, yes, yes. When he got, yeah, so what, uh, uh, he got like bored, tired of, of being in the, um, because he was still trying to manage his groups that he had in um, the progressions, the progressions, and uh, the singing groups he had. Uh, the know. four clefts and the epics. Yeah, God, you know all of those. Yeah, um, and he he would try to bring them over, but they they didn't. You know, so you there know, you guys, you four. And we were paid for all of that too, man. You know? What? And then Cannibal and Henners, because we were working, we were paying for all of that. Mm -hmm. that. That had to come out of, uh, I'm sure uh, that Seymour uh, uh, paid somebody, but uh, as far as the apartments go, we were paid for that. The way we were, so, nobody, so tell me, so from what I understand, you guys were mainly touring around the East Coast, right? Yeah, East Coast. Uh, uh, yeah, up and down the East Coast and the Midwest too. You know, we go all kinds of places. You know. Did you play in New York City as well? Some venues? Uh, no, to play in New York City. I think Eddie did after I left. They played, but to play in New York City, you have to have a special permit. A special permit to play in New York City. Yeah. So, so, so to kind of make it clear about the Headhunters, so we all know the original Headhunters were Rabbit and Star and Yo-Yo. 
And uh, at that point, all those headhunters were no longer in the group. And so the next headhunters were you and Eddie Serrano. Me and Eddie and uh, Tommy Lozano. And Tommy Lozano. Yeah, but uh, he stayed. Did he go to New York? Yeah, he went to New York for a while, but uh, it was his mom was ill and he just wanted to leave it. You know, you know, he had other plans. So how long were you in New York with him? About two years. About two wow. Years. About two years. And then what happened when uh, you came back? <laughs> uh, well, I got fired. Because, oh, okay. How'd that happen? Uh, I was messing with the, <laughs> the manager's girlfriend. Oh, that's not a good move. No. Wow. no. Yeah, Business-wise, it's not a good business move. Oh, yeah, so anyway, they fired me after that. Um, did Eddie come back with you or did Eddie stay? No, Eddie stayed. Eddie stayed. Did they, they play about it in another scene? Another one that was from us. It was Joe, I think. Uh, Joe was something. So and what did you do when you got back to L.A.? Nothing. Just floated around. and uh, Until the old time religion? No, not. When Eddie came back, I was looking to build a group. And then Richard Rosas said, uh, Rick Rose. Yeah. Uh, said he knew uh, uh, Steve Verdugo, another singer and player, songwriter. He, who had been in the Men From Sound after you. Oh, indeed. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, definitely. Did he beat up anyone? Oh, anyway. Of course he did. Right, go ahead. No. <laughs> going on, go ahead to the story. Um, uh, so where was I? Um, so you came back, you wanted to make a group. Oh, yeah, I wanted to make a Rick group. Rose, and Rick uh, Rosas mentioned uh, Steve Verdugo. Yeah. You had so Eddie he, Serrano. Yes. So we got together. And uh, Steve had a falsetto. As he done, was had the high note. And Steve done, I don't sing the high like that. And then we learned uh, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Helplessly Hoping. Mm. And we learned that song. And that was good. And, and the harmonies were great. So then, of course, he wrote songs and I wrote songs. Well, what, how'd you get the rhythm section? How'd you get Art Sanchez and uh, the drummer? Uh, because um, I had the jobs. And, and you got Art? I put together, no, um, we were with Eddie Davis. So it started out actually as, a, 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 we started out as a band playing, making money. Clubs. And it always was that. It always was that. We, we worked at doing that. And I was booking them usually most of the time. And. Uh, so talk about Art Sanchez. How'd you get him to be in the band? Oh, uh, well, we knew, I knew Art since uh, he was a young lad with Ronnie. I know, maybe, I know art all my life, you know. And who was the, the first drummer in uh, Old Time Religion? The first what? Drummer. Oh, Andy. Yeah. Andy. I can't remember his last name, but he was a great fellow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then for a while, uh, Leon Beckett played drums with him. And Leon Beckett was fun, too. He was good. I always remember one uh, uh, one New Year's, and um, Leon, Leon had this big uh, um, joint. I could call mm -hmm. it a joint. Big man with a cigarette, and he, uh, uh, we, 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 the stage was above the people, and uh, it was called the garage. And on New Year's, he just sparked it up, man. Then we were, it was so smoky. In those days, you could smoke at a bar, and nobody noticed you were passing it around. Then what kind of cigarette it was? Yeah, yeah, he's, he was a fine. He was a good job. Yeah. So I remember seeing you guys a lot at Carolina Lanes. Yeah, we worked at the Carolina Lanes. We did real, real well there. Which and was near the LA airport, LAX. Yeah, the LA airport. We, we did a song called Glory that I wrote. Uh, glory, I enjoy being with you. Glory, glory, hallelujah. It was a good song. And we recorded that, and Warner Brothers um, picked it up as a single. Uh, it didn't do too well. We did and the flip record. side was 47 Cents by Steve. 47 Cents. A little blues Steve shuffle. Steve wrote that, yes. And a little blues. A little blues. Of there. Um, which is a good song, too. That was a real good song. So on that first single, I think Andy played on that one on drums. Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. second single, who played on that? Was that Leon, or do you remember? Uh, no, uh, Magoo. I, that's all I remember his name as. He was, a, he was a drummer that worked with Eddie Davis. And the second single, to me, it, just, it sounded better. You guys were more experienced. And more tight, yeah. It was um, Itchy, Itchy feeling. feeling that you wrote. And on the flip side was Steve's... Uh, Swimmer. The Swimmer. That was a good tune, too. Yeah, sounded good, that record. Yeah. And so what happened with Warner Brothers? Well, that, that you happened. Two singles out. You had two singles two out. Two singles out, and uh, by then, uh, uh, we were still doing things. Steve Dugo, I wrote this uh, 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 Jesus song, and the Dewey Brothers took that idea, man. 
even the even the fact because Steve had it before and it was like a slow and then it went into the fast beat and they did the same thing. You're talking and about Jesus but, is just all right. All the old time religion, they probably saw it. Hey, well, oh, that's we did a religious song. That's a good idea. They heard it and they stole his idea. I know it to be true. But anyways. Um, are you saying uh, the Doobie Brothers version of Jesus is just all right? Very similar. Which was originally, I think, written by the birds, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Jesus is just all right with me. Yeah, that part, that part. Uh, yeah. uh, anyways, it was the way it was put together. The arrangement. I still yeah. believe what I said, that uh, the idea of uh, uh, everybody's passing it around, I guess. You know, that happens. You know. So so what happened with the Warner Brothers and how did the... Uh, but actually, that, that died out. And then uh, uh, we were still working. And then uh, Steve Verdugo left. And so he was replaced by Larry Cronin. Larry Cronin, yes, yes. Whose father owned Cronin's music in East in Montebello. Yes, and now this is because of an interesting story now. So he came with us because I had the uh, uh, the jobs, the the where a musician earned good money. I had the good paying jobs. And then um, Art Brambilla came into the picture. Here's where Art comes in. Mm. Art had been doing a thing with Tierra. And uh, I, Eddie somehow knew, Eddie knew them. And somehow it came to me. And because I was a writer and that we were a group that had done stuff before, that we would try to get an album like Tierra got with uh, uh, 20th Century. Well, that's where I come in too, because I was involved with art at that time as well. And uh, it was, actually, it was probably because of your contract, uh, and because yours was first of all with Luke. Uh, what was his producer? Your producer name? Oh uh, no! Well, uh, the stuff that came out on Capital Art was the producer on, at least in name. He was more of an executive producer. I see. I see. Uh, so, but just to to remind you, because we're talking fifty years ago or whatever. Um, so Art had convinced Capitol Records that there was a lot of talent in East LA. They gave him studio time at Independent Studios in Studio City. Yes, and he yes. took me in and I brought in, I was a solo artist at the time. I brought in Ernie Hernandez, Rick Rosas, uh, John Valenzuela, Anthony Bray on organ. And Steve Verdugo came in to play on one song, um, Rock and Roll Queen. And so I recorded those two songs. You guys came in and, and recorded a couple of songs. Uh, Tierra recorded some songs and he presented them to, to Capitol. And then somehow my single was picked, which was Rock and Roll Queen, backed with Lonely, came out on Capitol Records. He was free to take all the other groups to other labels. And uh, he, he wound up getting a deal for Tierra with 20th Century and a deal for you with Hugh Hefner and his new Playboy Records. Right? Uh, there you go. That's how that happened. Yeah, that was interesting the way he did it. But he uh, he opened up a good thing. I mean, he, it's just like he says these days. He goes, "Well, you know, I was just an executive, uh, you know." Uh, and in those days, I must say this: record companies would uh, 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 experiment. They would take chances, you know. Yes. You know, nowadays they don't take chances. You know, it's not it's not the same. Well, you know why? Partly, let me just say this: partly because I think still up to that point the record business was being run by record people. And in the late 70s, uh, corporations like the Kenny Shoes Corporation and Gulf Western were buying up record companies and yeah. suddenly corporate assholes were running the record companies and they changed everything. But yeah. up till then it was still, you know, you could get a shot, companies took a chance, you had a chance to get airplay, yeah. you know, it was a different, corporations were running it totally then by then, but go ahead. Yeah. So, anyways, we did uh, uh, we did the album for uh, Playboy Records, which was just a great experience. And it was a great freaking album. You guys were kicking yeah. ass. Yeah, it was a good rock album too. And by then, you had Ray Rodriguez on drums. Yes, Ray Rodriguez, Ronnie Reyes, uh, Art Sanchez, uh, Larry, and uh, you and Eddie Serrano, lead singers. Serrano and Rudy Regalado. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the Yaki album. It was great. You guys were hot. You were tight. Uh, and you, to me, you had like three different styles on that album. Some songs like your, your Blue Harbor, 
so Blue Harbor sounded like a Crosby, Stills, Nash record and had the three part harmony. And, and, and then, uh, and then you had some like hard rock stuff. Uh, you had stuff that was a little Led Zeppelin influenced. You had stuff, you had Latin stuff like Mitote. I mean, you guys were all over the map, but every genre you were kicking ass. Yeah. Well, perhaps that was the problem. You have to pick one genre. <laughs> being, the fact, being the fact that we are a, a, a club band too, we had done all those different styles. And then when, when they said, who could do Latin? I could do it. When, when, when Art said, when that came up, he goes, well, it has to be a Latin flavor. So I said, well, I'll write a song. I'll, I'll write, I, I can do that. And I wrote uh, Stempo Paro Cabio. Yeah, that's a big, that was the big one because that was a single, right? Yeah, it was a single. And it was uh, called uh, Time for a Change. Time for a Change. Now, what was first, in English, then Spanish, or Spanish, then English? English, and then the Spanish. Yeah, it said a Time for a Change, Tiempo Paro Cambio. And it was kind of like a La Bamba CFG 145 song with that kind of group. Yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of, yes, yes, I must admit, but it's just because <laughs> that, that it just swings, you know. Exciting. So, and you were just talking about uh, like Bob Dylan, it was time for a change, which it was. Oh, wow. Well, I thought so. And uh, that song uh, was a single. And then uh, in the 90s, it came out on a compilation on Xiania Records, which was a subsidiary of rhino records and i forgot which, which album it was on one was called Re conquista there was another one i'm not sure which of the compilation albums it was on but time your, your version of time for change was on that and then uh, during the obama campaign way way later uh Tierra recorded a new version of it and you didn't even know about that apparently oh no, i didn't I, I, but uh, they did a nice version of it as well so yeah. the song lives on it's one of your contributions okay. that have lived on Thank you very much. For me, that means great song. But that that Yaki album was great. Uh, now it was a new label, so for Hugh Hefner probably didn't know much about running a label. Uh, they had a st uh, Sony Records took it over after. It was just uh, it was just um, a million dollars isn't much to run a record company, and that's yeah. all they gave them. Yeah, one million that went fast. So before we move on from there, let's talk about. Uh, that whole thing was a cool period because you had, like I said, Yaki, Tierra, me, you know, all these different bands um, recording at the same time in the same studio. Tierra was making their first album um, and their first album was great as well. And, um, and then Art Brambilla had a, an office across the street from Capitol Records. And we would all meet there and we'd have meetings and we'd hang out there and Art was starting to, uh, form a company that he hoped would become a Chicano Motown. You know, he had the three groups uh, with record deals. He eventually got Carmen Moreno a deal with Capital as well. So he had several artists on major labels. He had his office. Uh, and that was kind of his goal. But uh, things didn't work out. But uh, Art has admitted, and he, he has said it in interviews I've had with him, that, you know, he was a young guy himself. You know, we were in our early 20s. He was probably in his maybe 26, 27, and uh, new to the business. And he'd never been a manager. He'd never run a record company. He'd worked for a record company in promotion and merchandising and that kind of thing, whatever. Was that young? But he said I, I, he didn't know what he was doing. He was young. He made some mistakes. We didn't know what we were doing business-wise, wow. that's for sure. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't happen. But, hey, we accomplished something by having uh, all these East L.A. groups get major labels major label deals and making some great records. Tierra's first album to this day sounds great. Yaki's and the stuff I did at that point. That uh, many of those songs wind up, wound up on uh, the a and album as Tango. But uh, we all made really good albums. Great albums. It still stand up today, I think. Right. It was a cause we were into. It, it was it was uh, admirable. It was worth uh, um, oh, yeah. uh, being men of La Mancha, you know. You we, we were pioneers, baby. To reach the unreachable. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so, so after that, after the uh, the the Playboy thing, uh, you guys went on tour a bit, right? You guys played the whiskey, and you played. You went to Canada. You did all kinds of stuff, and that's when Jimmy yeah. Seville joined. Yes, yes, they went to Canada. And, um, we went. Now, see, this has happened. I had the Yaki and Cannibal and Hannahs. Now, I wanted to diversify. But somehow the guys in the band took it all wrong, you know. But anyways, for a while we were going with Campbell and the Headhunters and Yaki, 
So the band would, we would play the Yankee song and then we'd do a show of Cannibal and the Headhunters in Canada, which was, I thought was good because I wanted to diversify. And that was without Cannibal? That was with Cannibal, yes. Oh, with Cannibal. Oh, yeah. cool. And then, uh, um, oh, it was fun. Okay. He's, he's a nice man. He was good to me. Um, we went to, uh, uh, like I said, Canada doing that. And I wanted to do it. I wanted to diversify with the voice felt that um, it was taken away from, from whatever, but uh, we should have stayed that way because after years after that, Campbell and Hitler and name kept going and going and going and going. And it could have been part of the Yaki Corporation, which I was looking at, but uh, things didn't work out as such. Uh, and uh, uh, I really, uh, uh, I really like that. It's a revival of uh, Cannibal and the Head and it has happened several, a lot of times. So oh, yeah. Well, Cannibal went on to continue to play a lot uh, you yeah. know, with uh, Robert Zapata and those guys. And with Eddie, Eddie uh, Serrano eventually became the new Cannibal yes, when yes. Uh, Cannibal retired. Yeah, when he retired, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. And, and it goes on to this day. Then, but, um, I, I was gonna ask you, uh, tell me about the story about um, when you guys played the whiskey and uh, from what I understand, <clears throat> um, Chicago, their lead guitar player had shot himself, Terry Kath, and uh, they kind of liked Ronnie. And they, <clears throat> I think they auditioned him or considered him. Yeah, they considered him. He would, he would have been a perfect guy. Uh, but see, the problem was, was this. Gary was, he was, the guitar player was still alive when he saw Ronnie. And Pizza oh. Terry. Yeah, and Pizza Terra liked Ronnie, and and so did uh, um, what was this? Terry Calf. Yeah, Terry Calf wow. like like him too. So they came up and they complimented him, and and they complimented the group. And I was, you know, really impressed because Ronnie's a fine player. I mean, just he's just a gifted uh, musician, and uh, yeah. And after that, um, I don't know if they tried to get a hold of him or something like that. After Terry Calf died. Yeah, if they would have got a hold of him, I'm sure he would have went. <laughs> With bells on. I, I'm almost sure I'll have to I'll have to interview Ronnie one of these days. But I think yeah, he said I, that uh, it, could it be that they offered him that and he chose to stay with Yaki or no? I hope not. <laughs> that would have been not a good. Decision. I hope not. I hope it's not. He didn't do it, Ronnie. No, uh, no, please. Let's no, forget. forget the loyalty. No, forget that, man. You know, let's buy a seat. I don't remember. We'll have to ask him. Well, cool. So, um, so that was a, a great period. That whole old time religion into Yaki, uh, that goes into 1972, into 73, you guys are probably touring around. And uh, what happened after uh, Yaki? In Canada, then Jimmy took off, split up, stayed in Canada for a couple of years, and Ray too. I came back and then I just started working on, uh, on, on bands like Eclipse, the Eclipse band, I worked with them. And, I traveled up and down California and did real good with them. And you did some cruise ships, didn't you? I'm getting there. Yeah, after that, uh, I just floated around. I, I did a, a, a lot of uh, uh, three pieces. I did the thing with Arlene, uh, uh, with Arlene uh, for years from you know in Arcadia, in that area. So that filled in by that time. And then after that uh, ended, um, I I got into a group called Romeo Band, and they were a cruise ship band. A, not, not hired, an independent band that the, the cruise ships hire. You know? And um, so they asked if they, I could go on the road. A lot of keyboard players didn't want to go on the road. I said, I'll go. Well, let's talk about that, because uh, when you were younger, back in the 60s, you were not a keyboard player much. You evolved uh -huh. into a keyboard player. No, no. I could play and write music, but to take the time to be a keyboard player, it takes hours and hours. I had enough time. I had my time trying to be a singer and a songwriter. I knew where the notes go, the chords hey, go. But in the 60s, I taught you the pentatonic scale, the all important pentatonic scale. That, 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 uh, you taught me some good things. That, <laughs> wake up, see, break up. You said long ago you knew someone, and now he's gone. So you no longer need me. Yeah. Yeah. But the pentatonic scale opened up the door to the blues and everything. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. But yeah, man, you became you're you're a hell of a keyboard player now. I mean, in terms of to accompany yourself, you're incredible. 
Yeah, well, you, you eventually you learn, you know. You, I learned when mostly um, after Yaki. After Yaki, I had, I had to play. Steve Rodugo helped me to, to, to foresee that. And, uh, and so then you could do solo gigs too, because you could accompany yeah, I did solo gigs. Then after I was on my own, I, I did okay. I, I did all right. Uh, you know, just uh, bumps on the road was, uh, uh, you know, uh, substances such as. And then bumps other road there, but anyways, I ended up uh, with a Romeo band going to was uh, uh, Royal Caribbean. I I toured all over with them, all, all through the Caribbean, nice. out of there, Alaska, um, uh, Poland, <laughs> Poland. Yeah, that was great. Which yeah. reminds me, since we're talking about ships, let's talk about the Catalina Island caper. Oh, okay. hold on, okay. we're gonna go back in time again. Um, let's see. Thank okay, you. Okay, Art Rambilla recently, I'll, like a couple of weeks ago, told me, or maybe last week, told me the story sorry. that I'd never heard that Tierra and Yaki uh, went on the Catalina ship to go play in Catalina. This must have been 73-ish around the time when, you know, you guys are still, you know, your early, you know, Yaki was still together. And um, you were hired by a... Um, a radio station, uh, which I will, will remain nameless, uh, a very popular radio station uh, in LA to go over there to play. Well, it turns out that the people from that station did not treat Tierra and probably Yaki very well. Maybe Art's impression was because they were Chicanos, you know, and it was kind of a racist thing. And they uh, somehow didn't allow Tierra to play. Something happened where they were very offended and very pissed off and a, uh, a melee ensued. And uh, according to Art, you know, Steve Salas hit somebody and, and, uh, and then Rudy jumped in and then the whole band jumped in and Art jumped in. And so Art called me up to ask me, he goes, well, Yaki was there too. I mean, didn't, they jumped in too, you know, and he was a little fuzzy on the whole story. So I called you up and you said, I remember that, but we weren't in the fight, right? Yeah. Where were you guys? Sorry, may I? Yeah, tell me. You tell me. Okay. Uh, all of a sudden, they come up to me, and they go, you guys got to get out, man. You're starting fights. And what, what fight? The boys are right here. My boys are, no, there's a fight, and you guys have to get off the ship. They're throwing you off the ship. The captain wants you off the ship. because So we didn't play. Now, they didn't throw Tierra off the ship. They threw you off the ship. They threw our band off the ship. <laughs> and Tierra stayed on, and they were the ones that started a fight. And I don't know, they must have said, uh, who started? And they pointed over there <laughs> to us. But they stayed on the ship, and they did a set. They actually did a set. A miscarriage of justice. A miscarriage. But, but from, from what Art said, uh, I mean, uh, Tierra had, you know, they were very insulted by the way they were being treated, and somebody must have said or did something that, set off the uh, ignited the melee um yeah uh, something was said uh, and the because, way they were treated uh, yeah i felt i felt it but uh, uh i ignore those kind of things you know but uh, them being from uh, um from where they're from el sereno uh, <laughs> um lincoln heights uh, uh, where is it lincoln heights or wherever they're from they got it <laughs> I'm sure that Kenny Roman must have had something to do with that, too. Oh, wow, that guy was a great drummer, man, Kenny Roman. The only thing is when we played with Linda Rodstadt in uh, um, Washington with a Yaki band. On our way to Canada, we stopped there. And we did a concert with Linda Rodstadt, and uh, she didn't like the band, and she didn't like her room, and she got so mad, she kicked the door and broke her foot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that's a memory. I'm sorry. I, that's, so, that did was, she perform? Yeah, she performed in the cast got in late. And did her. you back her? No, no, we didn't back her. We just did her opening act, strange opening act for a singer that was uh, doing the material she was doing. But yeah, uh, well, you know, that's the thing about bookers and stuff. Like my group, uh, Tango, in '74, we played at the almost brand new Roxy Theater. In Hollywood and instead of putting we were a rock and country rock Southern California type Buffalo Springfield type band and um, 
instead of putting us with Jackson Brown or Linda Ronstadt, they put us in with Flash Cadillac and the Continental Kids who were like a Shana Na group. So it was not our audience. So we had to open for them with all these kind of 50s kind of people. And, uh, you know, we, we felt a little uncomfortable. We went over okay. They liked Rock and Roll Queen, but, you know, we're doing I'm Brown and we're doing country and, you know, so it was a little, it was a mismatch. So a lot of these promoters don't, don't book the right, parry, parry with the right groups. Anyway, getting back to the cruise ships after, um, and after that, I, I floated around. I said, oh, well, I'll just do a single act. And I called up uh, uh, the um, cruise company and I did that for years. And I retired. And then in the uh, early 2000s, you wound up with Pat Vegas and Red Bull. Oh, yeah, that was good. Yeah, I retired the thing. And, I, and then uh, you were playing Hammond organ. Oh, yeah. I played the heck out of that. Man. I played the hell out of it. And how did you get hooked up with Pat? Um, Steve Royball. Steve Royball. He needed, yeah, they need, he's been a, a lifelong friend. And he's been, a, um, he's been a friend for many years. And he knows my playing. So he recommended me. Hey, you were Red Bone with us too. Yeah, then I joined in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then that's what I told him about you. And then you got in. And, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, Raven Hernandez was on guitar. When we played, remember when we played up in Limor near Fresno? We played up there with Pat and Red Bone. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, that's when uh, Lolly came. You know, he had already had his stroke. And uh -huh. Lolly was up there to receive an award with Pat before oh, yeah. the show. And then we visited. Uh, Lolly in his hotel room and everybody said hi to Lolly and then everybody took off to go to the casino and I stayed and I got to hang out with Lolly for like three hours talking and smoking great. some uh, herb and it was a great memory for me but you guys were more interested in going and gamble and whatever else but it was good for me because I got to hang out with him but um, you remember that show obviously we were playing outside right outside in the daytime and the sun was in our face uh, it was a little rough for that way, but it was fun. And on the bill with us was uh, Rose Royce. Yeah, Rose Royce. Yeah, we sounded really good too. We sounded good too. We had a, they had to be set up with a nice habit organ and you could yeah. talk. And yeah. it sounded really good. And I remember I got to sing one lead vocal, which was a, "It's all right, all right, babe. You're playing now, but it's all right." Remember that one? That one? Because because Redbone had recorded a version of that. Didn't know that. I, yeah. don't, I don't remember. I mean, I know that song. I played it yeah. with you. Yeah, we used to do it back in the 60s. Yeah. Well, and I think you used to sing it with us. I, I sang it a couple of times. Well, I sang it there, so it was kind of cool. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, I, I know what I was going to tell you. Since you brought up the substance thing, I remember, you know, driving you home one day and you, you were you were still messing with substances. And I, and I, and I told you, George, I mean, you got to You got to stop this, man. You know, if you want to have a long life and you got to stop this. And I said, maybe I'm in the group now. You know, the universe put me here to try to tell you to stop, you know. And you, as many people that are addicted, said, oh, I can stop anytime. I can stop anytime. And you didn't for a while. But thank God you eventually totally cleaned up. Well, only because I had uh, um, um, fate intervened and I got, uh, it finally made me sick. And then I went and I was, I was down to 123 pounds. And that was with the alcohol, no drugs, just alcohol. And uh, I was, I started, I couldn't, I couldn't hold even water down my stomach. So I had to go to the hospital. I had, I had, I had dehydrated so much. They had to give me a transfusion, two, two, two transfusions. That's how much uh, uh, I had lost because I started bleeding from my nose and hemorrhaging. I know like, oh, I was terrible. So I went to the hospital for about three months. And uh, after that, so you can get out for everybody listening. You can get off alcohol in, in a week. You could not. And I was getting this. I was getting shakes. Man. DTs. All right, man. No, come on. Man. You wake up and you go like this. Come on. Man. And then um, I, uh, um, I just got sick. I just got sick and, and it just uh it just caused it just caused me to end up in the hospital. And after after three months in the hospital, I came out and I go, Well, if I could go three months without drinking, I could don't go back now. You don't break a record. 
And the only reason I went three months is because I was in the hospital, you know, and just, you know, on, on sedated and things like that. But, you know, it was kind of like a methadone cure. I don't know. It was like, you know, like they had me on, uh, um, um, uh, I can't, I don't know, so I, I forgot what they gave me. But uh, after that, I came home and I said, no, I'm not going to, you know, because but I went. You've been clean for a few years already, right? Years, yeah. Um, I went to rehabs three times. And so for three times, I'd stop for about eight months. And then I'd come out thinking I could drink. Then like, well, what you do it again. Back again. Another time, the, the, I didn't do it. And then uh, back again, back again. You know. So the truth is, for anyone, you can't have it. You just can't have it. Can't even have one. Uh, be a man, be a woman. You just can't have it, man. You know, you just can't have it. Just well, you're alive it. today because you stopped. Period. Well, fortunately, I'm still in one shape. I don't have liver problems or kidney problems or anything so far. You're looking good, man. Yeah, I was going to say we forgot to talk about um, uh, the Yaki reunion that I was a part of. Oh yeah, you were part of that also. Listen, man, you've been all over my life, man. Yeah, I know. Like, hey, man. Is this is this nepotism right here? I don't I, know what the hell it is. Or, or uh, I really well, what, I have. what happened? Let me explain what happened. So we're now we're turning back a little bit to two thousand, I think two thousand five. Um, the right. Yaki album was not available anywhere, and uh, some people would were, would even write to me, "Hey, where's you know, where's that available?" So I called Art up, Art Brambilla. And I said, hey, you know, uh, what's going on with the Yaki album? He said, well, now he said that he owned the master. And uh, I said, hey, it would be cool if uh, you put it out again, even if it's just, you know, a limited amount. So it's available. And uh, so he said, yeah, it's a good idea. So I think he made like, uh, you know, a thousand copies or whatever, a limited amount of copies of, as a CD and, uh, and, and made it available again. And... Um, and then he came up with the idea, hey, we should do uh, uh, like a CD release party show and let's get Yaki together and, and do a show and, and uh, to, is that all announce, to announce the release. Mm -hmm. Is that how that came about? I don't know. I yeah. Don't... No, that's how it came about. That's how it came about. So, so then uh, you guys asked me to come in and sing because Eddie Serrano had passed away. And so... Uh, you asked me to come and sing Eddie's parts. And so I was happy to do that. You did the parts very well. Yeah, thank you. you did good. You did good. Go on. Please thank do. you. So uh, anyway, so then since I was there, we did some of my stuff. We did, I think we did Get Your Baby, Mark and the Escorts. We did my I'm Brown. We did uh, my dad's Chuco Suaves. So I had my own little mini set there, you know, among the, the Yaki set. And uh and I had a ball, you know, singing and playing Blue Harbor and, and uh, Tiempo para un Cambio, Time for a Change. And especially She Caught the Katie. You know, that was a favorite of mine on the Yaki album. That's a good one to play. Holy shit, Katie. man. Yeah. Now, let me say this about that. Uh, she Caught the Katie, I think, was, uh, uh, what's the name of the blues guy? Um, uh, Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal. And I think it's a traditional. I think yeah, it's, it's traditional, but he made a kind of a famous version of it, I guess, before you guys did it. And it's called, uh, you know, She Caught the Katie and Left Me a rule, Mule to Ride. And uh, I always loved it, man. You and Eddie Serrano, man, kicked ass on that, on the album. He sounded like the freaking Righteous Brothers on steroids. And uh, so I loved singing Eddie's part on that. You know, we're back and forth and screaming and it was great. It's on YouTube, by the way. Go to... Uh, Yaki, uh, 2005, at the Hop. It was at the Hop in uh, Pointy Hills, and all kinds of video from that concert's on YouTube under that name. And uh, she got the Katie is a, was a blast to sing that with you. It was fun. Well, I always was. Um, you always, no matter what artist you are, you should always do a song that everybody already knows. It's just, it's just, or, or one that they, you think they should know. The version we did of She Got the Katie was uh, uh, a little more rock and roll, a little bit different. I wanted to do the the uh, um, the rock and roll singing along with the arrangements, you know. Plus and you were playing uh, blues harp. Band. I didn't do those uh, arrangements. The band, I mean, I, I gave them the song and 
me and Eddie sang it, and then the boys got together, and, and Ronnie, and of course, yeah, Ronnie and Art and, and Ray put, and of course, uh, Larry Cronin, who passed away, he's gone. And you played a great blues harp on it, man. Yeah, I could play a heck out of a blues harp. Ooh, man. So that was a great, great show. And, and we had, um, uh, I asked Willie Loya to play a congas with us, which he did. And uh, I think Rudy Rigolato was with us and Larry Cronin and uh, Ronnie Reyes and Art Sanchez and me and you. And uh, we kicked ass. And I, one of the, what reminded me of this show was that Pat Vegas was in the audience. You know, Rudy Salas was there, so many musicians. But, but my theory is, I, I think that's the first time Pat saw Ronnie play. So that when you suggested Ronnie join Redbone, he was ready to go because he heard Ronnie that day. Yeah, you had reminded me of that. Um, I don't mean, I was playing with Pat at that time, I guess that's why he was there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, but that was a great gig, man, at the Hop in Quinty Hills. Probably, so probably the last Yaki uh, gig. So, and then, a few years later, we decided to get together just for fun at Little Ray's studio, remember? Oh, that was fun. That was just a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago. And uh, we rented our Little Ray's studio. Uh, all of us showed up with Jimmy Seville. And we did a bunch of Yaki tunes for fun. And we did I'm Brown. <laughs> and you were so into it, you were rolling on the floor in ecstasy. Yeah, yeah I was. I tried to tell you, because I, I would have noticed if there was any cameras in the place, because sometimes it's just a stale, <laughs> this guy. You couldn't find me. You go, where's George? Where's that lady? He's on the floor <laughs> in ecstasy. Yeah, well, that was fun, man. More of alcohol. Yeah, that's, you know. That's the, so that's, that's the story, man. So. That's about the story of my life there. Yeah, man. And so, uh, you know, so we, I, I feel we were very lucky to grow up in East L.A. at that time in the 60s when all that was going on, man. It's like a magical time. All those groups, all those venues and a lot of talented musicians. Well, we stayed in the music business. Of course, all of us did. And uh, that, that must mean something because that music business is a you know, tough it's, it's not always just and fair and it's not always clean. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, very well said, Professor. That's right. Yeah. But uh, the, it's great to play music. Music is great. The business is can be nasty and dirty and horrible. But uh, the music itself, it's great uh, to be able to play music and uh, and to play with great musicians. And we've both done that our whole lives. Well, in 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 a summary, to me, thank I, I want to thank all the musicians I ever played with for tolerating me and, and the type of things that was, but every one of you was a great musician, all of you, Bonnie, Art, uh, 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 Ray, uh, Jimmy, Larry, uh, Mark, um, uh, everybody, you know, all the people I played with. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for those memories. Thanks for the memories, you know. Uh, uh, hope. What do you so, okay, lot? man, well. Thanks for doing the show, George. And uh, that's about all I have to say. And uh, and uh, God bless everybody. And you know, those that see this and remember the bad part. You know, sorry, you know, alcohol. Well, it's just, I mean, so many musicians went through that. You know, so many, and many have talked about it. That's important because it, any young musicians watching this, it might be a cautionary tale. You know, yeah, just, you know just, just, just did a good thing. Some people can like you know just just. Watch yourself, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, well, thanks again, George, for doing it. And I hope to see you soon. All right, man. I haven't seen you in a while. I'll see you when uh, I see you. Yeah. It'll be pretty soon. You're, you're pretty close by now in Marino Valley. I'm in Cathedral Cities. Yeah. All right. Hey, man. Have a good one. Uh, okay. Uh, good talking to you. Goodbye, everyone that sees this. Thank you, from George. <laughs> okay. George Ochoa. Bye-bye.